Thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. So I'll be talking about uh, trapped ion experiments, both uh, past, present, and future. Uh, most of this work done in the group of Chris Monroe here at the JQI, and uh, some of the ongoing work for sort of my future project as a new faculty member. And it's a great pleasure to be here, and I've had a fantastic time in the JQI, uh, you know, working here for the past four years or so, and uh, looking forward to what's uh, to come. So this is an overview of what I'll be ta talking to you about. Um, I realize I've given um, two or three talks in this building in the last year. So I'm trying to not double up uh, uh, too much. So I'll give a quick introduction to ions and uh, uh, why they're useful and uh, what our current experimental system looks like and uh, how you can look at it as a quantum computer. Um, and then I'll mostly be focusing on results from uh, the past few months uh, which are, on the one hand, a sort of quantum computer comparison uh, that looks at different hardwares and also compiling, um, and then some sort of you know, machine learning related applications, including uh, QAOA, which um, is sort of an, a type of uh, optimization algorithm that has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about a current project, uh, which is, has to do with uh, simulating different types of quantum physics, including uh, paraparticles, which are kind of unusual particles that I'll uh, mention towards the end. Okay, so why is it such a good idea to do experiments on single ions? Well, if you want to uh, build a quantum computer or a quantum simulator, you want to have a quantum system that is kind of pristine, isolated from the rest of the universe and under your control. And a uh, single atom is a very good candidate. There are energy levels in atoms that we can use as our qubit states. Um, we can interact with them using laser light and we can detect their state using fluorescence. What's particularly nice about atoms, of course, is that they are uh, standards, which is why we uh, make atomic clocks out of them. Um, each ion of a given species is identical, so if you want to add more of these systems, you get uh, the same over and over again, which is good uh, to scale up. Then there's a slight conundrum here. On the one hand, you want these to be sort of nice and pristine and isolated and not decohere by coupling to the environment but you want them to couple to each other very strongly somehow because you're trying to get either some quantum gate going or some quantum simulation. And here ions are, have a particular strength in that they are charged atoms, which means they interact strongly with each other via the uh, Coulomb interaction. And if you trap them in a common trapping potential, they will form sort of modes of motion similar to modes on a guitar string, which they all share and which you can use as a um, sort of a bus or a resonator mode that's coupled to both of them to generate an interaction between them. So in terms of the sort of grand vision for this kind of system to build a larger quantum computer, um, the idea is you have some kind of trap arrangement where you can trap many different ions and uh, entangle any of them by shuttling them around or entangling them in a larger chain. And any system like this is not going to be infinitely large. So uh, you might consider this a module in an even larger system where you use entangled photons to connect different sort of distant modules um, of this type. And so, of course, we're not there yet. The challenges are we need to improve our uh, operations, higher fidelities, control more ions, and this is kind of a, a new point that I'll come back to later. Um, our classical control has to keep track with what we can do with these quantum systems. And so I'll show an experiment later where we were limited by the classical part of the algorithm as much as the uh, quantum part. Okay, so um, practical ion trapping, this is what our current, our current trap looks like in the basement. It's a uh, pole trap, you can see sort of uh, four electrodes here that uh, give you a radial confinement in this plane, and here are some segments that give a weaker confinement in this, uh, along this axis. And uh, this allows us to reliably trap a small uh, number of individual ions. And our favorite ion for these applications is the terbium-171. This is a uh, level scheme, looks kind of complicated, you only need to look at these two states down here, which is what we use as our uh, sort of main computational uh, state. And they have the nice property that they have magnetic field quantum number zero, which means they are insensitive to changes in the magnetic field to first order. And that makes this qubit very robust. Without any sort of magnetic shielding or trying very hard, we get uh, coherence times in excess of a second on these systems. Now, um, the other groups have done slightly better. If you, make, if you choose a clock qubit that's even more robust, that has sort of a second order um, um, Independence, you can get minutes of coherence times in a hyperfine qubits of trapped ions. Um, this transition here is what we use to uh, Doppler cool our ions, but also to initialize and detect the quantum state. So to initialize, we use optical pumping. You send in a particular frequency of light, and very quickly you pump down to state zero. 
to detect what the state is at the end of a simulation or a computation. You need some kind of state-dependent uh, measurement, and so we generate state-dependent fluorescence by sending in a frequency that only causes scattering of photons in state one, and the ion will stay dark if it's in state zero. And that gives you statistics like this, where a dark ion gives mostly no counts, and a bright ion will have this sort of um, Poisson um, distribution, and you can discriminate between them with pretty high fidelity. So we need one more sort of ingredient to turn this into a useful system. We need to be able to manipulate the qubit state. And for this, we use a, a Raman scheme. So uh, we send in a, a pulsed laser, which is basically a frequency comb, which is split up into two halves. And um, we shift them with respect to each other such that each frequency component, each comb tooth, interferes with its 107th uh, uh, neighbor to give you a beat note at this uh, hyperfine frequency, and that means we can drive transitions between these two states. Okay, um, now if we sort of step back from all these sort of individual elements and take a systems view, say, uh, look at this as a quantum computer now, uh, this is what a um, computer scientist would call the stack. Um, you're trying to run some kind of algorithm uh, here at the top, which comes written down as some kind of um, sequence of computational gates, which a compiler breaks down into your native operations, which are then applied as shaped laser pulses on your actual uh, hardware and your qubits. And I'll very briefly mention each of these uh, steps, starting at the bottom here. So this is a sketch of our experimental arrangements. These dots in the center are trapped ions. The trap itself is not shown. And these pink or purple objects are the two Raman beams I described two slides ago. They um, come in in a counter-propagating way, which is important because we're trying to drive motional transition, we're trying to excite these um, motional modes are described in the beginning. And to do that, the ion has to absorb a photon from one uh, beam and emit into the other to get a sort of momentum transfer and uh, give us this uh, capability of addressing the motion. Uh, there's one beam that uh, hits all the ions, it's a global beam, and the other one is split into many beams, each of which is imaged onto one ion only. And that means we have individual addressing in the system. We can control the amplitude, frequency, and phase of each of these beams, and that gives us a high level of control in the system. Now, um, to read out the ions, we use a, an objective here that images them onto a um, photomultiplier array. That means each ion has its own detector of light. Here you can see a channel number versus uh, photon counts, and that means we can tell at the end of an operation uh, for each ion, whether it's bright or dark, or for each qubit, if you like, whether it's in state uh, 0 or 1. Now, um, going up one step, what are the, uh, the native operations we can do in the system? And uh, the first one is very simple. Uh, we can just turn on our laser on resonance and we get Rabi flopping, which uh, we can do on each of these individual uh, particles. And that gives us what we call an R gate. It's basically a rotation on the Bloch sphere around an axis that we choose by the phase and by an angle that we choose by the duration. Um, more interestingly, we can uh, create entanglement by addressing the motion. So this is, um, oh, sorry, this is, a resonant transition that gives you those Rabi flops I showed on the previous slide. But if you detune by a motional frequency in the trap, you can change the spin and add, uh, subtract or add uh, a motional quantum uh, to the system. And of course, if you have a single ion, there's going to be in general three of these modes. So two radial and one axial. I'm only showing the uh, one radial that we're working with. Um, and if you put multiple ions in the trap, you're going to have multiple of these modes. And if we send in a bichromatic beat node, that means a laser near the red and the blue sideband simultaneously, we get um, a um, evolution that uh, uh, corresponds to a Malmö Sorensen gate, which means we um, drive a unitary that looks like this. There's some spin motion uh, uh, term here and a spin spin term. So this means the spin state gets entangled with the motion. Um, and we can uh, set this term to zero if we choose uh, carefully a pre-calculated pulse shape, which means we sort of excite and de-excite the motion, come back to rest at the end. But during this evolution, we get a spin-spin entanglement. And if we do this right, um, we get, a, we get an, uh, a unitary that looks like this, which if you set this parameter chi here to the right value, gives you a maximally entangled uh, belt state. Now, all the ions participate in the motion, as you can see up there, uh, but only the two ions that have the laser beams on participate in the spin evolution. And that means we can selectively 
uh, entangle any pair of ions in a longer chain. And so that means we have basically here a fully connected system. I'm showing nine here because that's uh, what we're working towards. At the moment, we have seven in our, in our system. We're currently setting up for nine. And so by just turning on selectively pairs of beams and, and uh, playing back this pulse shape, we can connect and entangle each of these. And each of these gray lines is basically a possible entangling gate in the system. Um, OK, so how do we turn these individual uh, interactions into uh, some useful gates. So I'll give one example of a, a computational gate. So that's the gate that's the control swap gate. So here we have a, a qubit that controls when uh, if it's one, the state of these two is swapped. This is the, the truth table for it. And if you write this uh, down as a sequence of our native gates, you get a circuit like this. So this looks kind of complicated, but just to point out, each of these gates is either an entangling gate or one of these rotation gates that I presented earlier. And so our compiler essentially is just a lookup table. We tell it to do a Fretkin gate. It looks up the sequence of gates. It fills in all these sort of parameters automatically based on calibration of, of the system. Um, and then we can play it back and uh, generate a Fretkin gate. And this is um, basically rep replicates the truth table that you saw uh, before. Uh, this is just tr trying different input states and seeing what state we detect. OK, so now we have a library of these. Um, and we can basically run any quantum application or quantum circuit that we like. We just program in uh, the gates. They get broken down into a laser pulse shape. And, uh, and they're played back. And so um, last time I uh, gave a talk here, I showed you this slide, which is basically since we published the first results on this system in 2016, we've sort of had a string of different people uh, contact us and ask us, uh, you know, would you be willing to run my particular application on your system? Um, and on the one hand, that's kind of surprising because the system is relatively small. It can't do anything you couldn't do on a uh, classical computer or maybe even on a piece of paper. But still people found, <laughs> well, it's fi you know, it's five qubits at the time. It's true. Um, so um, turns out people still find a lot of value in, uh, in uh, running their particular ideas and implementing them on a, on a real system. Uh, so the only thing I've updated since last year are these... Uh, uh, references here, um, but also since last year I can extend this to a second slide uh, with some more ongoing and uh, uh, additional projects that are happening right now. So I'll focus on uh, three of these. One is this latest uh, um, benchmarking and comparison experiment. Um, the other one is, um, uh, sorry that's on the previous slide, the other one is this machine learning uh, experiment here and uh, QAOA, uh, very top one there. Okay. Um, so you may remember that uh, two years ago, we, we already ran a hardware comparison between this system and the uh, five qubit IBM uh, chip that uh, you know, is online via the quantum experience. Mm. And um, a few months ago, we were contacted by uh, Margaret Martinosi's group at Princeton because they were undertaking sort of a similar comparison, but with, first of all, more different hardware, uh, hardware candidates or hardware systems and a larger array of different algorithms. Um, so this is kind of the, the overview. So each of these here stands for a particular application. One of them is the Fretkin that I showed, but also various different other gates. And um, so their project involved uh, first of all, improving the compiler. So it's not just uh, basically a, a simple lookup table and you implement all your gates, but it sort of intelligently chooses which gates to put on which ions. Um, but also it involved all these different uh, various uh, quantum computing hardwares. All of them except ours are, of course, uh, superconducting uh, qubit devices, three different ones from IBM and uh, Rigetti. And so I'm going to show the results. Some are going to have bars colored uh, like this, and some are just going to have uh, letters here. F means the quantum computer didn't produce any output, didn't work. Um, and S means that, was, that particular one was not tried. Um, and so these are the results. Um, you can see Rigetti is mostly F, uh, but most of them... <laughs> No, most of them worked reasonably well. Uh, we only worked, um, we only did this for five qubit uh, circuits. So our bar is not here. But overall, in uh, you know, looking across this, you can see that all the, uh, all the big black bars near one are, are our system, which is kind of nice to see. Um, but it is, you know, life isn't just about beating the other guy. It's about beating yourself. And so the, what we need to do here is not just look at uh, small algorithms at sort of near our peak performance. Uh, we need to see, is there any benefit in doing these kind of improved calculations or um, compilations on our system um, in an application where it really matters. So here, um, 
you know, they use their compiler to optimize which gates to use, um, but the difference for us was very small because the, the fidelities are already reasonably high. So what we did instead um, is we chose a more difficult application and we sent them a sort of calibration table. So here you can see different gates between ions in a, in a five uh, ion chain and some of them are you know, very good and some of them are less good like this one here. And that just uh, has to do with uh, some of our, you know, we have some noise in our system of course, the gates are not uh, perfect, typically 99% fidelity. And that's because um, you know, there's some vibrations of the beams, these motional um, uh, transitions are not gonna come back to the same initial point in phase space perfectly and so on. And so we find that some gates work slightly better than others. And so if you take this data into account in your compiler, um, how much better can you do? Um, and so we, um, we ran the Fretkin gate that I showed you uh, multiple times in a row. So each Fretkin gate has seven entangling gates. And if you run the Fretkin gate multiple times, you go up to you know, uh, 49 uh, entangling gates at the maximum here. And the gray is just using you know, random assignment of qubits. And uh, black means choose the optimal set of gates, the, the ones based on these metrics, uh, that are supposed to give you the best answer. And you can see if you go to very deep circuit, uh, circuits, this kind of compiler choice actually makes a difference now. And that's kind of important to know. And that means it's worth investing in a, in a better compiler. But what's also nice here is that um, as you go to deep circuits, uh, nothing crazy is happening in the system. So this kind of decays as you would expect. You do more gates, you get more errors. Um, and that means if you improve your gate fidelity, even a little bit, at deep circuits, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna go up significantly. And this sort of gives us confidence that if you scale the system up and improve the, you know, keep step with your fidelity in terms of your size, um, we will be able to run very deep circuits on large ion numbers in this system. Okay, um, maybe I'll, I'll stop very briefly if there's any questions on this, because I'm gonna go to a different topic, so yes. A, so this is, you only get an advantage from this reordering because of the old all connectivity. Right, like the other superconducting implementations wouldn't be able to swap things around. That's, we have more choice, that is true. But of course the others also have multiple qubits. So some of these chips um, have you know, 14 qubits with obviously not fully connected. But if you do a Fretkin gate, it's a three qubit gate. That means you need three you know, uh, qubits that are connected together with three gates. You, there, there's several choices you can do in these systems. And so all of these were done after this optimization. And uh, I didn't show the plot here, but there's also a plot for each of these um, where they compare before and after optimization. And for, for most of these systems, there was a big improvement, but for us, we didn't see a big improvement because we're already you know, reasonably high here. So we needed to choose a, a difficult application or a, you know, a deep circuit to really see uh, this difference come in. Yeah. So you made the comment that, well, nothing uh, surprising happens when you do more gates, yeah. which is just what you expected. But the fact that you said it makes me wonder whether there was something behind that. In other words, mm -hmm. does the fact that you don't see anything crazy happening mm -hmm. uh, say something about uh, uh, alternate ideas about fundamental sources of decoherence in quantum mechanics or you know, is yeah. there something deeper here? I mean, the errors are, I would say, big enough that we can't say anything about these sort of um, you know, very deep concepts about quantum mechanics itself. Um, but the point is, we don't have any noise sources that maybe come in at deeper, uh, uh, you know, circuits. So, what, would, what sort of thing would happen that, uh, uh, in the way of noise? Well, what kind of noise circuits would you imagine that would? Come well, in a funny let's way? say if there's some correlated noise uh -huh. that builds up as you put more gates. So you don't just say we have a little bit of, you know, we ge generate a little bit of mixedness after every state, but maybe you have some correlated coherent error that builds up, and then because what this is, each of these, this is a Fretkin. I should really say what this number is, success rate. Um, we just ran the circuit back and forth for the state uh, one uh, zero zero. So, uh, sorry. 101, one, so it'll just flop, flip the last two between one and zero. So there's a definite state that is the answer after each of these circuits, just one out of the eight possible states. And this probability is just how likely are you to measure that state. And so if you have some coherent error that maybe builds up, you could imagine that population shifting to a different state um, as you grow. But that's not the case, luckily. So this is very promising also if you think about error correction, uh, where correlated errors are a big worry. Um, and it doesn't seem like, at least at, at this depth here of about 50 gates, that we see anything like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, how many gates are in in the gate circuit? Uh, seven entangling gates. And then there's some uh, about 20 or so single qubit gates, but their errors are much lower than the entangling gates. So can you get from that a simple rule on uh, gate 
given, say, 99 uh, percent up there, that those are reasonable. Yeah, so this is, this is near 50 percent, or yeah, around 50 bit more. Um, and if each gate has about 99 percent, uh, you know, that should, that should be something like between 50 and 60. So that propagates as you expect, roughly, which is, which is very nice. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll move on to a different application, and these are um, uh, quantum classical hybrid uh, algorithms. And so they've gotten a lot of attention because uh, one thing a, a quantum computer is supposed to do is solve uh, problems like maybe finding the ground state of some complicated molecule. And many of these um, applications have a part that is hard for the quantum computer, or sorry, hard for the classical computer to do, such as evaluating some uh, complicated Hamiltonian. And another part that's less hard, such as maybe varying some parameters and optimizing over it. And so the idea between this hybrid quantum computing is you split your task between a quantum computer and a classical computer. You let the classical computer pick uh, variables or, or parameters that you then uh, run on a circuit on the quantum computer. And um, thereby, you find uh, an uh, answer or a, a property that you're looking for uh, more efficiently. And so we kind of use the dummy example uh, in machine learning that's called generative modeling uh, for a, a bars and stripes uh, example. So this is basically pixel patterns of bars and stripes. And the idea is you're trying to uh, generate a uh, distribution uh, based on these states. So in this case, this is a four qubit system. Each of these patterns is a particular state. And we're trying to find uh, uh, the preparation of an equal superposition of these. So this is our target state. It's an entangled state. Uh, where each of these have this um, uh, same contribution. Um, and we're going to start by running a circuit that contains uh, individual rotations and entangling gates and so on. And each of these is parameterized. So we're going to start by choosing these parameters randomly. We're going to run it on our system. We're going to get out some garbage, compare it to the actual target. And then, based on that, get a cost function that a classical computer can use to optimize the circuit. And as this sort of cycles around, the machine learns how to prepare this circuit um, uh, perfectly. And um, so to do this, we pick two different connectivities. So in these entangling layers here, you can basically choose what gates are available. And so fully connected means all of these gates are available. Uh, Star-shaped connected means only these are available. Um, and each of these individual gates here, so each box has a parameter associated. And you can see there's quite a few of these parameters, you know, eight here plus six over here. Um, and that can sort of pose some problems. Um, so that's the, the system. So the part I haven't talked about is the classical part over here. Um, how does, what does this learner look like? Um, and so we pick two different um, classical optimization schemes. The first is particle swarm optimization. So if you don't know what that is, this is a little animation that shows it. The idea is you pick various so-called particles. They are basically points in parameter space. Um, and uh, these parameter configurations, you associate a sort of momentum in parameter space with them. And they will swarm around. And as they move, they are attracted by their friends who have found a better place. They're attracted by their past history points that are better than their current point. And so they collaboratively search the space. Some of them will just get stuck out here. But some hopefully find the, uh, the global optimum. Um, but you can see how this is kind of wasteful because you know, not every evaluation of the function is actually meaningful. Um, so alternative, as an alternative, we also uh, use Bayesian optimization, which basically is a, a you know, it, it explores the space similar, than the, uh, similar to how you and me would approach this. You'd look in a certain region, and maybe uh, if it doesn't look that great, you look somewhere else. Basically, you take into account um, where you have already gotten some information and where you haven't. So the, the choices are made a bit, more, uh, a bit more deliberately than they are here. And so um, to do this, we used a, uh, a sort of classical software package called Optas made by a, a startup company in Oxford where a sort of former colleague of mine uh, is a professor of machine learning and he, he sort of thought his uh, package would be a good choice based on our uh, problem set. Okay, so I'll move to the results. Um, so these are the three uh, scenarios we picked. So this is a fully connected system here, um, and there's two layers, entangling and uh, single rotation layer. And we started by simulating the system. So rather than running it on the ions, we, uh, we used a classical uh, computer to evaluate the circuit and see how this learning pro progressed. And so you can see here it goes down to a, a minimum of the, the cost function. This shading here um, corresponds to different initial states of this particle swarm. Because, of course, 
in the beginning, we choose a random set of parameters for each of these particles. And depending on if you're lucky or less lucky with this choice, um, you might be further or closer to the, the, the real minimum, and it might take longer or be harder. So this is what this shading indicates. And then uh, we ran it on the uh, experiment. And you can see these are the results. The red is the target, and uh, the blue is what the experiment gave us, and these correspond to each other uh, reasonably well. Now, um, in the uh, star-shaped connected case, you can see that even the simulation doesn't reach the, uh, doesn't get very close to zero here in the cost function, and that's because there are simply not enough entangling gates to generate this entangled state shown in red here. So the best you can do is to create a state that has some extra components here. You can see these two. Um, and uh, again, the experiment follows this reasonably well. I should say we cheated a little bit here. So we, we ran all these different initial points that you see shaded here. Um, and then we picked out of these, you know, we tried a few hundred and we picked the best one to run on the experiment. And this is simply because if we picked any old one out of them, the experiment, because the experiment obviously has some additional errors on them, uh, on it does, did not really converge as this blue line shows. So these blue lines here are sort of somewhat pre-selected, if you like, amongst the classically tested uh, random seeds. Um, of course, if you can't get to the state with the two layers, what you have to do is you add more layers. So the next part here is you run the same connectivity, but you add another rotation and entangling layer. And, um, and this is the results. Um, you can see there's quite a, a wide shading here of uh, of uh, random initial states, but even with the best one out of roughly a thousand, uh, the experiment did not manage to converge uh, with the particle swarm. Uh, you can see here that you know the correspondence is not that great. So um, basically, these are the limitations of the particle swarm system. So what uh, what does it look like with Bayesian optimization? So before I go to that, I want to want you to remember a couple of numbers, which is that it typically takes you know maybe 700 or 600 steps to reach the uh, uh, convergence. Yeah. Um, so if you, uh, not using like machine learning, but presumably like the, the best possible method, how many layers would it take for you to prepare the state on the star? So you can prepare it with two layers if you just sort of solve it I, uh, ideally. So with two, we should be able to get it. It's just that um, the learner doesn't. Uh, the simulation sometimes does, but even the, you know, even good seeds. Um, didn't really didn't really work out here. I should say we used um, 56 particles uh, for about 26 parameters, which you know maybe you need, maybe need more particles. But the problem is every every step here, every one of these 1,500 steps we took means you have to evaluate uh, you know an extra circuit on your actual experiment. So here, this was a heroic effort <laughs> to uh, run 1,500 different circuits on the quantum computer. Still no convergence. So time for a different optimizer. Um, these are the, the results on the first two. Uh, you can see there's no shading this time because there is no random seed for the Bayesian optimization. Um, and just as in the previous case, except now there's no um, pre-selection, um, the, uh, the learner is able to converge to the correct state, uh, both for this one and that one. Here, the correct state, I mean, as close as possible, of course, with these two extra states over here. Um, but crucially, no, two crucial points. First, we didn't use a random, we didn't have to pre-select a random seed. But secondly, here, it does it in half as many function evaluations as the particle swarm. And that's simply because the particle swarm has a bunch of particles that are sort of wasted, as you saw in that little animation. OK, but now, crucially, what about the, uh, the more, more difficult uh, simulation? And you can see, in this case, it succeeds at getting to a low cost function value. And we represent the, uh, the target system reasonably well. So it turns out, so we had to work with this uh, company Mind Foundry. And what they say is this is already kind of near the limits of what classical optimization can do. Uh, 26 parameters is a large system, yes? Tilde be compared directly like its value to be on the previous slide? Yes. Um, it's, we calculate it slightly differently. One is like symmetrized and one is not. But in both cases, zero means uh, exact match. Um, yes. And so this is, you know, this kind of uh, makes you wonder a little bit about these hybrid schemes because this is a very simple system with four qubits and four layers. <laughs> And has 26 parameters. You know, it's not. It's not that. Shouldn't be that difficult. But in terms of optimization schemes, 26 parameters is a lot. So um, if you imagine, okay, we're trying to, you know, 
uh, solve world hunger by doing nitrogen fixation. We need to calculate a complicated molecule. Maybe it doesn't have, you know, it's not going to have 27 parameters. It's going to have like 100 or something, or maybe more, several hundred. Um, so what that means is you can't sort of blindly assume that the classical part is for free. The classical part in these schemes, um, if you, you know, if you go to many parameters, the classical part is going to be as important as the quantum part. And so we need kind of a co-evolution, I'd say, of quantum hardware that, of course, has to get better, but also to find uh, classical software that maybe can take advantage of some symmetries in the system or some other, you know, clever ideas to make this more efficient to, to really get it to work. Um, so one of these um, ideas to, to maybe reduce the number of parameters is uh, QAOA. Uh, quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And uh, the idea here is um, you simulate the system by applying the, uh, the quantum operation in a simplified way. Um, and so I'll, I'll briefly introduce the example we used and then how it works. Um, so we use this to prepare a so-called quantum critical uh, state. It's the ground state of this Hamiltonian, which has two parts. It's basically a, an icing model, which has all these different XX interaction and uh, additional Z term over here. And so the ground state of this is going to be an entangled state in general. Um, and so you can get it either by um, starting in the eigenstate of one of the two and adiabatically turning on the second. Um, or you can use this sort of new idea, QAOA, where you just uh, apply them sort of in a bang-bang approach. You just sort of hit the system with this one and that one consecutively, and you sort of get somewhere close to uh, the, uh, the ground state. Um, and so here, for example, this is depth two. Depth is how often do you do this. Um, you apply uh, hz, hxx, and so on, uh, each parameterized. Um, and at the end, you, 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 know, you vary these parameters to minimize the overall energy to find the ground state. Um, and since you know, not every single xx interaction, but just the overall Hamiltonian has a parameter here, this is, in general, less parameters than in the other case. So we did this on a ring. So this is all the gates used. So you can see this is seven qubits. Uh, each neighbor is connected by an XX gate. So this is sort of parameter A uh, corresponds to this Hamiltonian. And then parameter B are these individual uh, Z rotations. Um, yeah. And so this is the, uh, the exact value of the ground state energy that we want to get to. Um, and it turns out, theoretically, for this problem with seven qubits, you need three of these layers uh, to get there. Um, and so the first thing we did was to see maybe if you use this optimization, you can get, um, you can compensate for some errors in the system. So we started at the, uh, at the sort of ideal parameters and let the system uh, run and explore and see if there is maybe a gradient towards a better value. And as you can see here, these are the parameters. They basically stayed constant. Um, black is the energy, also didn't change much. Um, so uh, that means the theoretically calculated uh, minimum energy state is pretty close to uh, what we actually get out of the experiment. Um, but then, of course, in an ideal situation, you don't know what the answer is, so you can't put it in. So we also started at a random place for the parameters, which is here. And then we iterate it, and we uh, try to get to the minimum state. And here we didn't use any very sophisticated iter uh, optimization method. We simply used gradient descent because there's two parameters, and the system is sort of well behaved. And that was a, that was a good choice in that case. And you can see after about four states or so, uh, four iterations or so, we reach, uh, we reach a plateau near the um, actual minimum of the energy, about 5% you know, off. Um, but then, you know, it's, not, uh, it's limited not only by experimental error, but also by the fact that this was only one layer. Um, and so I said in the beginning, you need, up to th you need three layers to really get the exact state. So what happens if we go to more layers? And here is a slightly more humbling result. Um, this is the ideal energy here. Uh, this is what, the th you know, theoretically, if there's no errors, uh, this should just go down here with three. Um, and you can see if we go to two layers, so this is now... Uh, 12 gates, uh, it doesn't really change much, but then when you go to three, um, the error goes up. Um, and that means once you go to a very deep circuit, the uh, gain from the additional you know, theoretical improvement here is actually swamped by the error uh, from the additional gates that we do. Um, and that means, of course, also for QAOA, um, you know, improvements in the system, in this case quantum, uh, need to happen to make it useful. You still get a reasonably good answer with just one layer, so there's some use to it. Uh, but I think you know, for QIOA to be you know, the revolutionary new algorithm, um, you know, we need to maybe some additional improvements in making the system or the, the circuits more efficient. OK. Um, any questions here? I'm going to move on to something else again. Yes? Is there a way to make use of kind of work 
physical qubits and error correct these ones to reduce the errors such that this might yeah. But you, yes, that's right. If you, if you have a, a set of gates here with no errors, then this, should, this blue should really follow the yellow. Um, but for that, you need you know, a, a, a set of errors that is low enough to begin with to be able to correct them. And this is not yet the case in our system. Um, yes? So coming back to this idea of correlated noise, like, uh, so is, is the experimental result consistent with what you expect from the error model? Yeah, it, it, looks, it looks kind of like it goes, up, it goes up steeply here, but this is because um, you, when you calculate the energy, it's not just sort of the fidelity of probability of getting one state. You have sort of have prefactors, um, and some of these sort of small values sort of start blowing up. Um, and that's why it looks like that. But it's still, you know, what I said earlier about this um, uh, compiler is still true here. Um, but just when you calculate on energy, uh, it gets more sensitive in some, in some cases. Actually, in this vein, following up on what Bill was asking earlier yeah. about fundamental uh, um, limits, and well, this is most likely all just noise, yeah. are you putting any fundamental limits on the size of the uh, entangled system uh, not breaking? Uh, I don't think we're putting any limits. I think because this is seven qubits, people have made bigger entangled states that still kind of work to within the expectation of quantum mechanics. So it would be nice to make that claim, but I, I don't think we can. Our, our, we know what our noise is, and it's, it's reasonably big. It's like... You're putting limits on it, you're just not... Oh, I guess we're putting limits. Yeah, it's like saying I, I found a fossil, dinosaurs died out at least yesterday. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> It's not really a limit. I think that will help someone to explore the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so scaling up. So there's, there's several challenges. Uh, one is a compilation challenge. So you know, I made a big deal earlier about our full connectivity, but of course the system is not going to be fully connected uh, forever. At some point it's not going to be efficient to add more ions and transfer information from this guy to that using a gate like I showed you. That's going to slow down. And so um, you might not want to extend this infinitely long. But we have additional um, possibilities in trapped ions because our um, qubits are these particles that we trap with electric fields. We can actually physically move them. And what you can imagine is having a fully connected system over here and in the same trap, uh, move part of it over here and then have a fully connected system on the other side. And that means overall you still have a pretty densely connected system, just not fully connected. Um, and then maybe that's, you know, again, not infinitely scalable, but you might want to uh, connect this to a different module of the same type using an ion that generates entangled photons uh, to connect it up. But think a little bit about what the compiler now has to do in this case. So, um, you know, we started with a lookup table, um, and now a compiler actually has control over the structure of your circuit. The compiler can choose uh, where to, you know, where to split the chain, when to split it, when to move it, where to move it, and so on. When to ask for this resource, everything's going to depend on the different cost metrics of each of these elements. And so, in general, I hope we don't need a quantum computer to program our quantum computer. Um, the good news is we don't need to find the global optimum. We need to find a working solution. But we are approaching, I think, a scale where thinking about these problems is, uh, is relevant. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, one more project which relates to this part over here, now, generating entangled photons and being able to send them uh, to a different module, maybe one that's further away than, uh, than the same lab. Um, and so the problem f uh, in this realm has been that uh, Systems that make good quantum memories or quantum processors, like the ones on the left here, have uh, UV and visible photons. And uh, photons that we would like to send across distances are uh, in the telecom range. And one uh, strategy that has been used for this is uh, frequency conversion. So you send the photon from this guy into some pumped nonlinear medium, and you get a photon near this frequency out. Um, but that's only you know, worth it uh, depending on how far you want to send it. So if you think about a node here, you can draw two circles. One is how far you could go if you had the ideal photon. And the other one is um, what I call the direct transmission radius. Um, if you're in that radius, you'd rather um, transmit the photon directly uh, rather than take the loss of photon uh, frequency conversion. So if you look at uh, absorption in a fiber, uh, the question is what would be, I would say, 
the lowest sensible wavelength uh, where you could extract a photon and send it. And the lowest sensible wavelength is near this minimum. So this is, of course, the global minimum, but there are some other minima here. So I would say 1100 is probably the lowest you know, sensible frequency you would still send over you know, a few miles distance if you could extract it from an ion. Um, and so the question is, is there such an ion? It turns out, yes. This is strontium-88, and there's a transition right near 1,100 nanometers, and this is a scheme to uh, generate entangled photons. So the idea is you pump to this state, you excite up to here, with a certain probability you're going to decay along this path. And um, if you only collect sigma photons, you're going to end up in a superposition of uh, uh, sigma plus zero and sigma minus one, and that means you now have a photon that is near a... Uh, telecom wavelength entangled with the uh, ion qubit, if you like, that stays behind. Um, and so just in the you know, past month or so, Mika has started uh, designing this. This is kind of a first draft of a very old school trap. It is a single ion experiment after all. Uh, the idea is you want beam access and optical access in all directions. So maybe the trap's gonna look like this, uh, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, okay. Um, so in the last few minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about something completely different. Um, well, not completely, but it is uh, slightly different in terms of tone. So we're going to start with a nice picture. Um, this blue blob is meant to indicate uh, mystery. Um, this is about paraparticles. Um, so what are paraparticles? Um, this um, commutation relation is familiar to all of you. It's the normal uh, boson um, creation annihilation operator. And so a, a bosonic oscillator will have a commutation relation that looks like this. But you can also um, uh, change this by adding this extra operator and deform this oscillator. And you deform it in a way that uh, this is called a reflection operator. Um, and it has some properties. But the main point is uh, you can generate a parabosonic or parafermionic um, oscillator of a given order if you, uh, you, know, if you write down a, an equation like this. And so uh, where does this come from? Um, in the sort of early days of quantum mechanics, after the uh, regular harmonic oscillator was discovered, people found that you can add these deformations and that you can identify them with paraparticles. So you're going to have a para Bose and para fermionic oscillator. And um, the energy kind of looks the same. It just looks like there's an additional sort of offset to it, but the dynamics are actually quite different. Um, and so in... Um, it was realized very recently by uh, uh, Cynthia, who's now my student, and her supervisor, um, uh, uh, Blas Rodriguez Lara, that uh, this Hamiltonian maps directly to an trapped ion Hamiltonian. So if you have an ion uh, that is trapped and interacts with two Raman beams, um, you get a Hamiltonian, you know, assuming reasonable approximations, uh, that looks like this. Uh, this is the, the spin state two different motional modes and coupling between the motional modes and the spin, similar to the, the beam arrangement that I showed. Uh, what this needs, and this, this picture sort of indicates that you need two different modes that you can address. And so what you can draw here is two different beams, one for each mode. Um, but if the two modes are not you know, aligned like this, in fact, they typically don't align like this, they will align along these two different blade directions, you can actually address both of them with one beam, just because they have different frequency. Um, and so I thought with um, uh, uh, our system, you should be able to realize power particles, uh, you know, assuming the, the regime that is needed for this kind of simulation is uh, realistic. So let's start with power bosons. Um, what is the actual interaction you need to apply? You would need to apply a blue sideband, uh, or James Cummings term, on the first mode and a red sideband on the second mode. And that leads to a conserved quantity, basically the difference of the excitations plus some spin here. And by choosing that, basically by saying uh, at what uh, motional excitation do I start my simulation, I can pick the Parabose uh, order. And from this, you can construct um, these Parabose operators. And so how do you measure that you've done this? So how, you know, what is the thing that you can really do to characterize that it behaves like a Parabose uh, system? And so what you can do is generate so-called Parabose coherent states or coherent-like states, um, which use these operators to make a state that behaves differently from a regular oscillator. Um, and so P is the, the different order. If you do this for different order and you measure this property called uh, Mandel Q parameter, which basically says um, how does the um, uh, variance relate to the mean of the para um, particle number, you can get 
uh, so one recreates the regular oscillator, which means it's zero everywhere. But if you uh, choose your para, uh, both are all are different from one, you can see sub and super Poissonian statistics. So I showed you a Poisson distribution earlier with the photons by detecting uh, you know, photons from the ion. Um, but this shows that depending on the order, you can get uh, narrow or wider distributions uh, uh, than you would, you would expect from a Poisson uh, mean. And so can we realize this on our system? Unfortunately, there's one symmetry that is required. So this one here, you can see both modes actually need to have the same frequency. So if you wanted to do this, you really needed, you would need two different beams or maybe a, an atom in two cavities. Um, so in order to realize this, we're going to map it to a spin system because we, of course, have a, uh, a digital quantum computer. So this is a, a way you can map this. Uh, Parabo is a particle number just map to different uh, spin states like this. And if you do it like this, something very nice happens, which is that the, uh, the creation operator actually looks like a sigma sigma, which of course is exactly the native interaction that we have in our system. So we don't need to trotterize this and approximate. Of course, we have to cut off somewhere because we don't have infinitely many qubits. But if you don't go to very high excitation, you can basically implement this exactly uh, using gates. And so what we want to do is prepare this state using gates and uh, here is a circuit that does this for uh, n up equals to 2. It's not optimized yet. I think we can compress some of this down. But the idea would be you can use this preparation to uh, generate a state like that and measure these statistics that I showed earlier and show that it works uh, as you expect as a power particle. Mm. So that's kind of ongoing. Uh, power fermions are slightly, uh, well, and in one sense, they are more, you know, more optimistic about them because you need two blue sidebands to generate them. The conserved quantity looks different. It's basically the total uh, phonon number in this case. Um, but it's more complicated to extract uh, you know, the parafermionness of them, if you like. So up there is one of the sort of uh, canonical operators, I3, that uh, governs the dynamics of the system. And these are sort of uh, uh, simulations, what happens to the, the particle numbers in the uh, basis of the, of the ion, if you like, and the spin. And from this, you can calculate what this uh, parafermion oscillator does as you evolve it. So the idea would be to actually implement this parafermionic Hamiltonian by directly applying uh, Raman beams near the two motional sidebands and uh, hopefully recreate some of these dynamics. Um, but we're kind of still working on what's the, you know, what's the best way to measure this. OK, um, with that, I'm going to uh, conclude. So this is kind of the, uh, uh, I would say, first generation of people who uh, turned this experiment into a, a programmable quantum computer. Um, these are theory collaborators, uh, Marcello and Alejandro, who worked on the uh, hybrid quantum computing optimization uh, routine, or like the, the concept of the Basel stripes method, and Sonica and Tim um, for the QAOA system. And then uh, currently, um, these are the people working in the lab, um, Blas and Cynthia, who came up with the paraparticle system. Um, and this is a kind of a first uh, group photo, I would say. Um, and I also mentioned that I'm looking for postdocs, so if anyone of you is going to finish soon and is interested in any of these subjects, uh, please talk to me. Also, we, of course, all have to uh, work on the uh, gender imbalance in physics that often exists, so e <laughs> even if you're a man, uh, please don't be shy. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm wondering about these uh, these paraparticle systems, which I don't think I fully understand mm -hmm. yet. But but one of the features, or at least one of the ways in which you study them, is to get these non-zero Mandelbrot mm -hmm. Q parameters. Now there are other natural systems that naturally produce mm -hmm. non-zero Qs, like yeah. uh, uh, spontaneous emission, for example, mm -hmm. is a standard thing that makes a non-zero Mandelbrot yeah. Q. Yeah. Do those things in any way exhibit any features that you could interpret as being paraparticle? Mm, I, I don't think so. I think there's been, so when this was first sort of mathematically formulated, it, show, it was shown that the actual particles that we have in nature don't behave like paraparticles. Basically, you can derive some selection rules that say that normal particles cannot decay into paraparticles or vice versa. And therefore, no particles that we actually know in nature are paraparticles. Uh, yeah, but what you've done is, is hook up some system, mm -hmm. some more complicated system yeah. with some imposed interactions mm -hmm. that then behave like a paraparticle. That's right. And what I'm wondering is whether something, you know, a highly saturated I see. Uh, uh, a single atom, which is uh, not, I mean, it's not, a, it's, 
that system isn't a natural part of it, mm -hmm. but it's something you've hooked up, whether somehow that behaves or mm -hmm. could be labeled in that same way. I, I don't know. I, I don't know about another system, but in a way, it's true that this system, uh, you know, because this, uh, this Hamiltonian can be relabeled in terms of paraparticles. So if you actually apply this uh, here, you can directly you know, get this behavior back. So in a way, you're realizing it. Of course, you know, you're doing it deliberately. What you're wondering is, does it happen naturally somewhere? Uh, but, well, yeah. I mean, it's a question of what you call natural. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So that, that, that's, Everything is natural. That's, right. that's what I'm saying. That's, that's exactly my point here. This, if, this, if you call this natural, then this is a system that was identified by the people studying paraparticles, uh, where you can get this behavior. Uh, you know, and in the, in the parafermi case, it looks like with our experiment, you can do it, you know, not breaking it down into gates, but directly applying something like this that will get this dynamic back. So if this is, if this is natural, an ion trapped and interacting with tailored laser beams, if that's natural, then that would be a, the candidate. And this is how, this is sort of our connection to it. There might be, might be others, I don't know. <laughs> so I always ask this question. Sure. But, uh, 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 you got all these wonderful gates. They're ninety-nine percent mm -hmm. for for this and that. Ninety-nine percent for de for detection. Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to have to do better in the end. Sure. And what I'm wondering is, uh, is it clear to you that you can? Uh, for example, mm -hmm. when I look at the things, I see ninety-nine percent for detection. Yeah. I mean, detection is one of the easiest things. That's right. Ought to be. So why aren't you doing better? Well, people have shown... Don't you have to? Uh, so in everything we do, we only read out once at the end. Um, and so it, it doesn't really limit anything we're doing. But people have shown in this very system four nines of fidelity for readout. And it's only a matter of... I didn't really say what limits the readout. It's the fact that when you detect the light, as you apply this sort of detection beam, you pump the ion dark very slowly. And that means if you can do it fast, if you can collect more light and do it shorter, you can basically arbitrarily push. Uh, you basically turn this distribution into a perfect Poissonian. Um, and so that's really it's kind of a technical limitation. So in Jung Sang Kim's group, they've shown, I think, four nines uh, of fidelity or for readout. Um, and for gates, the best gate that has been done is also an ion gate uh, with 99.9%. .9%. So that's uh, an order of magnitude better than, than we can do, but it was done in, uh, you know, Two ion, with two ions exactly. So if the, if the universe is two qubits and the time ends after the gate, it's helpful. So what, what the challenge is is to combine this together with the control of many ions. Um, you know, and I think um, these pulse shapes that, we, that I showed you here, they're not really the end of the story in terms of, um, I mean, what they are designed to do is to close these motional modes. But I think there's many additional robustnesses or like additional properties that you can build into them. You make the pulse shape more complicated, but that means you, it also works at maybe slightly different detuning or, you know, even if there's some intensity noise, it's kind of, you know, flat towards that. Uh, um, and that has not really been done. So I think there is maybe a perfect pulse shape out there that is robust to frequency, intensity, and phase noise and produces a, a better gate more reliably. But of course, we need to also passively stabilize all these things. Uh, so last week we had this talk from LPS mm. and some of the things that he showed in terms of what it would take to do a certain kind of calculation mm. looked really scary. Mm. Are you scared? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not really, because what, uh, you know, uh, it seems like people with much worse systems are in business. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're okay. So obviously, you're asking, you know, when is the quantum computer of the future going to materialize, and how much does it cost? Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's it's true. It's scary. If you want to look at, you know, what does it take to have a meaningfully error corrected system of 100 qubits that you can use to, you know, do Shor's algorithm, you need like millions of gates and so on. Um, so that's, you know, that's clearly not obvious that you can do this right away. Um, so I right think right away. I mean. No, maybe ever, but the, uh, the thing is, we, we, there, is you know, there is no sort of r fundamental roadblocks that are there at the moment. So everything that I show that limits us at the moment is kind of uh, understood, I would say. Um, and so that, that makes you hopeful that you can improve for quite a while longer. I can't really answer how do you get from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5 error, because I, I don't know what will be the main limitations at that point. And, and maybe there'll be a showstopper, but probably not. Um, so... I don't know. It, uh, at the very least, it'll be a lot of fun uh, to <laughs> fail at 10 to the minus 5. But I, I, I don't know. All right. Well, why don't we thank Margaret?